The Kyle Rittenhouse verdict has put so many people, including myself, in a state of not necessarily confusion, not necessarily surprise, but definitely despair. Hi, I'm Lace Watkins, Executive Director of the Lace on Race Center for Racial Equity. If you would like more of what you're seeing here, be sure to press the like and subscribe button on all of our various platforms. Today is a very subdued video. I'd like to be able to talk about this in ways that are perhaps a little different than what we have seen in other media and from other commentators. I've read a lot of them and I agree with every single one of them. It is outrageous. The jury was unfortunate. But today I would like to keep the focus on the action itself, the action that precipitated the trial. We talk a lot about the spectrum between entitlement on this end and hope on the other. And a couple of days ago, maybe a week ago, I put up a meme that showed a slice being taken right out of the middle of a given pie. That's worth remembering. That's worth remembering. Entitlement is never only about entitlement. Entitlement is always about power and oftentimes entitlement is also about what you can get away with. We saw what Kyle Rittenhouse got away with at the jury verdict, but that was the culmination, the culmination of a series of permissions that permeated throughout his life. And that is something that I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about the macro when it comes to entitlement, and I want to bring it down to the micro. I want to talk about our own lives and how we have, if we are not very careful, we have the mustard seed of Kyle Rittenhouse in every one of us. Some of us can make more use of that mustard seed and get away with more than others, but entitlement is a siren that entices or has the possibility of enticing us all. And that is something that I think is really important to think about. Why is it important to think about this? Let's go back to that wonderful piece of pie that I choose to think is sweet potato pie, not pumpkin, but that wonderful round sweet potato pie with eight equal slices and one slice just taken right out of the middle, negatively affecting those who would have had whole slices. But I think that there's something important to think about when we're looking at that um, illustration. That illustration meets its limit when we start talking about proportionality and who is hurt worst. If you go back, it, it, it's on the Facebook page and it's also at the Bistro. If you go back and look at that meme, you'll see that some people were affected heavily. Some people were, expect, were, were affected minimally and, and some of those slices didn't seem to be affected at all. The people who are lucky enough to have the slices who were not affected by the act of entitlement, they have choices to make. They can just sort of say, I got mine, which is the American response. Or they can say, wait a minute, I know that this pie that I got is pretty much intact, but you took 80% of the pie from this guy over here, and I can't enjoy my pie until the 80% is rectified. How often do we do that? The short answer is not very often. We don't think about the other slices of the pie. And even when we see a bad actor manipulate the pie, as long as we got our shot, we're good. 
I'm going to invite us all to, as we consider the aftermath of Kyle Rittenhouse and the lessons that there may or may not be regarding him, that we think about this. Let's go back and talk about entitlement for a moment. We talked about that spectrum, right? The spectrum between hope on one end and entitlement on one end, and then going off the charts altogether, toxic entitlement, which is what we saw. In order to talk about entitlement, though, we also have to talk about fear. We have to talk about fear. And if we think that, that, that we may not get enough pie, that there's not enough pie, we will go and stamp ourselves in the middle of the pie. Devil may care what happens to anyone else. We are fear of the other stakeholders of the pie. Let me say that again. We live in fear of the other stakeholders in the pie. That was actually Carl, Mr. Rittenhouse's um, defense, that he acted in fear. Entitlement. With entitlement, fear is the coin of the realm. And with fear... Entitlement is the coin of the realm. If you are afraid, existentially afraid, physically afraid, if you just say you're afraid, it's because you know that you know no one no one can 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 really question your interior state of mind. If you say you're afraid, you're afraid. That's permission given. If I'm afraid of you, then that means that I am allowed to pretty much do whatever I can to protect myself from you. I don't have to do any self-interrogation, whether wondering whether or not the fear is justified, whether or not my response to the purported fear, metaphorical or actual, is justified. Is my response proportionate? Am I entitled to bring along tools in my tool belt that will ostensibly keep me safe, but definitely at the expense of other people and not just assault weapons? But I'm also talking about the metaphorical as well. What do we have the right to? What do we feel entitled to do to protect ourselves? And we can talk about the out outlier of Kyle Rittenhouse, but I want to bring it back to us. Like I said, there are plenty of articles, and, and we can link some below, that, that make great analyses of what went down in that courthouse in Wisconsin. But what I've also noticed in the last 48 hours of being absolutely immersed in this stuff is how external, how external the responses are, particularly from white people. <sighs> That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And this is easy. This is easy to point fingers and externalize. We can, we can have an indictment of the entire justice system himself. Certainly that judge who stacked the deck. And of course, Mr. Rittenhouse himself. But if we are not willing to take a look at our own choices individually and collectively as society, and in this case, by we, I mean white people, Ah, the hand wringing and the laments perhaps ring a bit hollow. I actually uh, wrote a prayer in response to another prayer, which you will also see um, on the website and um, at the takeout window, that was a response to a white woman's prayer. It was well-intentioned. I'll give her that. We, we won't even... I concede that, but it was also pretty activating. She looked at a distance, and I think that that is kind of the siren that most good-intentioned progressive white people are going to do. This is absolutely a situation where the system definitely is under indictment. <laughs> the judge, Mr. Rittenhouse himself, but we also have to look at the conditions that were set 
and fomented that made a Kyle Rittenhouse possible. If we are not willing to look at those conditions, what Kyle Rittenhouse went from the spectrum, not hope, not even healthy expectation, but to toxic entitlement way off the charts, we have to look at what got him there. Very rarely does something this like this occur in a vacuum. What happened in his life before that was permission giving and then permission giving and then permission giving and then permission giving? That's where it is time to look at not only societal forces and not only at parental choices, but the soup in which Kyle lives in. Now, let's be real clear. Let's be real, 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 real clear. This is not an absolution or an absolving of Kyle Rittenhouse, but he is a product of his time. He is a product of his, of his, of his environment. And this is not an absolving or allowing Kyle Rittenhouse off the hook. No, quite the opposite. It's putting way more people who would love to hold themselves above and apart from Kyle Rittenhouse and putting them in the same courtroom, putting you in the same courtroom, putting us in the same courtroom. This is important to note. When we choose to hold ourselves above and apart, to distance ourselves, to almost dissociate, we hold this as an outlier, as a one-off, instead of seeing this as the logical extension of the soup that we live in. We make a grave mistake and we clear the path for another Kyle. And there are only so many times white people can clutch their pearls and look shocked, shocked. I wasn't shocked. I wasn't shocked. I was dismayed. I was disheartened but I was not shocked, particularly as we see how quickly white people flame out when it comes to other social movements like the Black Spring about this time in 2020. The way to make sure that there is not a Kyle Rittenhouse ever again is to confront and challenge and dismantle the systems that made a Kyle Rittenhouse possible in the first place. And that will take more than white people standing above and apart, wringing their hands while we moan. It means skin in the game. It means seeing yourself in Kyle and doing the rooting and the weeding necessary. It means, oh, this is a tough one. It's a tough one. It means looking at your kids looking at your friends. It means really doing a strong study and investigation and interrogation of what healthy expectation and toxic entitlement mean. It means taking a hard look at what you fear or what you say you fear and whether or not calling it fear is just permission giving for entitlement. It means holding yourself to a standard that not only looks away at dismay when something happens, but has the courage, the courage to say, where do I locate myself in Kyle? Where do I locate myself in Kyle's mother? Where do I locate myself in a system that made that fateful day occur? If we are not willing to do that, we meaning white people, if we are not willing to be able to do that, as I said in my prayer, that I render you mute, please. If you are not willing to confront and challenge and dismantle the systems that made for a Kyle Rittenhouse and made, crucially, for a jury that let him off, Don't ask black people to do your heavy emotional lifting for you, which is what you are doing when all you're doing is saying, we stand with you, we wail with you. Um, 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 uh. 
six years into the new or the renaissance of white interest in civil rights and, and, and racial justice, fully a year after the Black Spring, those words ring so hollow. So hollow. So what can we do? What can we do in order to make this meaningful, in order to lessen and mitigate the harm that happened in Wisconsin? It means seeing our own culpability and our own collusion in the systems that made for it. I already talked about that. It means finding out where there are Kyle Rittenhouses in your particular areas. And there are. It means really doing the deep dive into black and brown people who did far less, but who suffered at the hands of a justice system far more. They're out there. Find them. Put them down here in the, in the comments. They're there. I might prime with a couple, but I want to see what you guys come up with in your own regions and states and towns and cities. One of the problems about high profile cases is that they do become one offs and everyone is staring at Wisconsin, but they're not looking at the at, at, at what's going on in their own towns in California, in Louisiana, in Iowa, in New Jersey. And believe me, it's happening. It's happening. Later on today or tomorrow, I'm going to post a link to a New York Times article that talks about the dangers of traffic stops for black and brown people and how it is become more, becoming more and more of a revenue generator, particularly for small jurisdictions, and how the disproportionality of both stopping and the ramifications of stopping fall to black and brown people. That's something you can do. Here's the thing about prayer. I like prayer. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. God works through his people. The universe works through people. And we cannot sit passively on the sidelines while people are suffering and dying. But we again, we, meaning like people, but also people of color as well. We cannot watch our brothers and sisters in pain and be, in and be in silence and stay silent. We all must, must do this crucial work. We need to set the conditions for actual freedom and equity and justice, and we need to dismantle the toxic and fetid and putrid systems that made for a Kyle Rittenhouse who was walking the streets free. Who is walking the streets free? If you are less angry than you were on Friday, that needs to be interrogated. People have kept on, are you going to write anything about it? And I am. I'm going to transcribe this and there will be something written and I might write some more. But what I'm going to focus on also is the Arbery case down south. part of the same system, part of the same toxic system. And we're going to talk more and more about entitlement and what we owe each other and what we are owed because Kyle Rittenhouse thought he was owed a lot. Whenever our responsibilities to the world are eclipsed by what we feel the world owes us, there will be literal blood. Stay tuned for the next one. If you appreciate what you have heard this far, again, press the like and or subscribe and or follow button on whatever platform that you're on. Be sure to share this. It is public. Make sure the attribution goes to Lace on Race. If you'd like more of this, make sure that you go to what Lace on Race the website, as well as the Facebook page. If you have any comments or questions, and I know you do, put them down wherever platform you are. I read every single one, every single one. This has been a tough 48 hours. And if we do not learn lessons and then execute what we have learned, it is in vain. 
performative gestures are exactly that. They leave me cold. What can we do for real in a durable and reliable way? That's the question that should haunt you today, and those are the answers you should be coming up with below.